Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our virtual panel on family governance and social crisis. This webinar is being held as part of our Governance and Family Plans webinar series that we've launched to support the sustainability and resilience of family businesses across the Gulf region. For those of you who've been following us from the start, the Governance and Family Plans program is our flagship program, and where the Pearl Initiative really came to life as the region's only non-profit business-led organisation founded to promote a corporate culture of accountability and transparency across the region's private sector. Family businesses are truly the world part of the Gulf economy. They employ up to 80% of the private sector, not more, workforce, and contribute generously towards the regional GDP. As such, their success is critical to the wider diversification of Gulf economies, which is a goal that has its pleasure to mean again in regional vision plans. In addition to the challenges that family businesses face just by virtue of their very nature, such as family conflict or succession planning, they must also withstand the implications of the current financial, economic and societal challenges brought, brought along by the global pandemic. These factors pose a threat to the survival of all Gulf, old, Gulf family owned businesses. Despite the fact that the landscape is rapidly shifting, family firms have the opportunity to mitigate the adverse impacts on their businesses and approach the situation on strong footing through addressing these compl complexities from a long-term perspective and proactively limiting these changes. Family business boards also have a vital role in providing strategic guidance through spearheading core governance practices to secure the overall sustainability of the organisation. Moderated by Frida Ajami, a general manager of Third Family Business Forum, this webinar will explore a robust governance framework and strategic action from the board's value of the crisis. Partnership is part of its partnership with um, Farawat Family Business Forum. We've worked with them for over five years, I think now, and um, they're a key partner, especially on our Family Business Firms program. So we're really grateful for the support and the collaboration. And um, it's really uh, meaningful when you can create such meaningful partnerships um, that can impact the ecosystem. So thank you to Frida and the Farawad Family Business Forum team for that. Um, today, um, the session will be moderated by Frida. Frida. Um, I'll give you a quick introduction to all the participants. And I think they're also gonna quickly beef that up with you know, the less formal um, bio of themselves. So to start with Frida, she's, as I mentioned, is the general manager of Farawad Family Business Forum. It's a private network and knowledge hub for family owned companies in the Middle East and North Africa. Founded since 2009 to support and foster the sustainability, innovation, and growth of family firms. She has set up a variety of programs across around corporate entrepreneurship for business owners and is a founding member of the Global Women in Family Business Network. She is currently also editor at large of the Thoroughworth magazine and a director at Target Developments LLC and Orbis Terra Media LLC, her family's firms in Switzerland. Frida qualified as a barrister at the Swiss Bar, practiced administrative, administrative corporate and contract law in a leading Swiss law firm, and worked for several local and federal government agencies. Her previous professional experience includes positions as associate lawyer at the United Nations in Geneva and as executive legal advisor on corporate structures and transformation of family-owned firms. Thanks again for Frida for your support and for moderating this. As for our speakers today, um, as I mentioned, these are shortened bios, they'll all introduce themselves personally. But we have Kareem Kupti, and he's a second generation family member and is currently the commercial director at Telectron. Telectron has been operating in the UAE for over 45 years and is active in energy, telecommunications and the distribution sector. Kareem has completed a bachelor's degree in economics from Montreal, Canada, and followed by a master's degree in energy, trade and finance from Cass Business School, City University of London. Kareem is currently based in Abu Dhabi. Our second speaker for today is Zahara Malik. Zahara is the CEO and co-founder of Grosvenor Capital, a boutique advisory company headquartered in the UAE. Grosvenor Capital focuses on pro providing clients with business strategies, consultancy, capital introduction, and advisory services across the GCC, Africa, and beyond. Current sectors include education, healthcare, infrastructure, and power, with a key focus and passion around impact investment. Thank you all for participating. Um, as for all of our sessions, we do like to make them as interactive as possible. So um, you'll notice that there is a panel for questions um, and those questions will be filtered through to leave Frida, who will be sifting through them and asking the panelists. Um, so please do take advantage of their experience. I always tell them we've got great thought leaders in, in the field with great experience. So do leverage that and take advantage. And um, I hope you enjoy the session. Thank you very much, everybody. And thanks, Frida, again, for taking this board. Pleasure. 
So uh, welcome everybody. Um, I just wanted to do a very quick uh, introduction myself. It's a true pleasure uh, to be here with our two panelists, uh, Karim and Zahara, and I promise it will be a very interactive and, um, and informative session. Um, I'd like to encourage you really to participate. I, I see I have the list of attendees in front of me. I know many of you personally, and I also know that you have a lot of expertise as well. So let's make this as much of a, of a conversation between uh, yourselves and us as much as it is between Karim and Zahara. So um, the way we are going to conduct this session today is that Zahara is going to give a brief introduction of, on the topic from her perspective, followed by Karim, uh, also a brief introduction on the topic from his perspective, and then we'll have about 30 odd minutes to have a, a general debate amongst ourselves. Uh, we will also have a poll, uh, or actually two perhaps, uh, where we would love to have your feedback. So get ready to interact with us and uh, we hope you'll enjoy the session. Go ahead, Thank, you so Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Sorry, I was having a little bit of a, a technical issue there, but such a pleasure and a special thank you to the Pearl Initiative team and the Thoroughwood Business Forum for hosting us. Um, to Yasmin, Sameh and Farida, obviously, for moderating. And obviously, it's a pleasure to be here with my colleague Kareem today as well. So a real pleasure. Um, I have been given a strict timeline in terms of uh, 10 minutes introduction, so I'll try and keep things very, very brief. Um, but to give you a bit of background, and again, thank you to Yasmin for a, a great introduction. I essentially founded Grovener Capital just about a year ago with the prime focus, as, I, as, as mentioned, to really try and drive and shape a narrative for impact investing. But to give you context on the family business side, I've spent the last eight years prior to this really working with family businesses, corporate institutions, who were really driven by looking at Africa as an investment opportunity. Following that, my father has been absolutely delighted that I decided to finally embark on the journey of entrepreneurship and thought that it's about time that I come and support uh, the family business, which is primarily focused on real estate um, across London and Greater London and has been operating for over 30 years. And uh, he's been delighted because amongst the other siblings, the eldest being a doctor, the other one being a lawyer by profession, he thought, right, at least one of, one of us will come on board to, to support. Um, so it's been a great pleasure of, over the last year to really try and understand uh, the family business. And of course, with the pandemic, which is, was, has been a shock to the system for all of us, whether we've been affected directly um, to those that we may have lost in the, in the pandemic to also those that have gone right through the value chain of, of livelihoods. And it's been a really, really, really testing time. And so for us, I mean, I won't go into it. I was just saying to Farida and Kareem that I won't hark on about Brexit um, too much. And I won't go into that because that will shift the discussion. But essentially, you know, the UK particularly has been going through quite a, um, you know, it's been quite a difficult time, turbulent time. And I wouldn't say that the pandemic has sort of, you know, thrown it over the edge, but there has been, you know, interesting insights that we've also personally seen. So I believe that, Aviva had mentioned that during the pandemic, so commercial real estate has dropped by 12% and residential by 15. And that's sort of a double-edged sword. So for us as an existing portfolio, if we're looking to get rid of any of the assets, then you know obviously our valuation has gone down, but at the same point, it's put us in a better position to make it a bit more of a buyer's market. So it's been a really interesting time for reflection. I mean, we've had to think about, you know, what else can we do to make sure that there isn't a direct impact? And I think, you know, there's going to be a lot of themes and discussions today, but a lot of discussions I've been having with my peers has been very much focused on employee, employee wellness and making sure that we're taking care and accounting for those um, that, that are working and that are working within the business or beyond. So I know that that's been a key focus for us, as well as, of course, having had to pause some of our more greenfield projects of development. Um, but luckily enough, we've, we've started to re-engage as the 1st of June, but in a much more phased approach. So, you know, construction generally is quite slow um, at the moment, but and it's been slowed down even more so. So, of course, there's been a direct impact. Furthermore, I mean, I won't go into too much about the, the issues about the UK and, and go into sort of a strict analysis about um, what's going on. But, you know, I was also just mentioning that Yesterday, I think there was an, an, an analyst from Bank of America that actually deemed the pound as becoming emerging market currency, which is absolutely shocking. <laughs> I don't think any of us had expected that. Um, so, you know, I think there's, there's a myriad of, of issues that are, are developing. But I think, as I said, if we kind of look at the double-edged sword where 
actually there is it's quite positive to, to be much more looking at a buyer's market at this stage. Furthermore, um, philanthropy and impact, of course, I won't try and half on about impact investing too much today, but there is definitely sort of nuances of it that I will touch on. Um, but Family Foundation has been very important for us. We've been running a foundation for the last five years with a focus of the northern part of Punjab in Pakistan. And our reaction to the situation has been much more on direct aid, which again has not typically been what we've done to date. It's been very much focused on education and girls' education, but we've had to react um, and really think about you know, whether it's getting equipment to whether it's giving direct aid and relief to families that have been affected. And I've been running a school personally in Chittagong, Bangladesh since 2012, and also seeing the reaction of the foundation on the ground there. It's, it's been really interesting because actually pre the pandemic, on the foundation side, it's been much more about adopting a impact structure where things are a bit more long term, measurable um, and not necessarily sort of instant philanthropy, which is, of course, important and plays a significant role as well for a lot of family offices. And of course, I know the incredible work that Pearl Initiative is doing about the importance of governance within philanthropy, for example. So there's lots of there's a huge importance of it. For, but for us, it's been interesting to see the need to react fairly quickly rather than have a much more sort of strategic plan um, in place. So if I may, I've got a few slides and this is just to kind of, I, I promise I won't go on, on too long, but um, just a few points and more reflections that we've had over the last three months. And of course, you know, we've got some incredible listeners that have joined us today and, and, and guests and attendees. So I would love for you to share your insights. I think it would be, um, a really great opportunity to learn from you because I think we're all the one sense that has been fantastic is that we're all learning from each other in this in this instance um so I'm just going to quickly whiz through a few of these slides and um Farida and Yasmin have copies of this so if you would like to to receive these afterwards please let them know but PwC had done an interesting survey about how this 82 percent of CFOs had expected that COVID would actually decrease companies revenues or profits for the rest of the year so quite a morbid, quite morbid, but again, I think it's about trying to stay as, as, as realistic as, as we possibly can. But, you know, I think the family business realm has historically been able to be rather resilient. Uh, and because of that and being able to be agile, we've been able to react fairly quickly. And as, as us as well, we're a fairly small unit. We've been able to be quite agile and nimble and be able to react accordingly. Um, so historically, family businesses have been able to really think about you know, what are our foundations and what's the long term and strategic focus, but also be quite reactive, which actually is probably where I know we'll touch on governance shortly. But I know that that's, you know, a, a key debate um, of, of sort of the structures that are needed and sort of the lack of bureaucracy or the need for bureaucracy. So if I just sort of mention that and then I won't read off the slides because I'm, I'm not here to sort of lecture, but it would just just to touch on a few points per each slide. As I mentioned at the start, employee welfare has been really, really at the forefront of a lot of discussions that I've been having, whether it's internally as, as a family ourselves or with other families or just businesses generally, because I think for, for most of us, we would have had, it's much more of a, a sort of long-term loyalty play of those that have been working with the family. And we want to make sure that there's a sense of goodwill and that they're taken care of. So it's been really interesting to see the certain models that family offices have been in, in making sure that actually rather than just issue redundancies, how can we innovate, how can we save and make sure that actually we do not add to global unemployment that is, you know, had been has been rising irrespective, but of course this has really created somewhat of a springboard. I won't touch too much on business liquidity or family liquidity because I know again we've got some veterans on the call um, and you know happy to to share the slides going forward. And again if we just look at the sort of a few points in terms of what are some of the ways that fat, sort of enterprising families have have reacted or can react and i'll just again highlight on a couple of points here so we've got we've got the sort of key focus on rebalancing portfolio so we've also been very reflective in terms of where our current portfolio is what is our growth what is our short term versus our long term and really looking at uh, you know the balance between both of this if, if I also touch on another point, um, you know, let's really think about how we can revisit governance. So those that do have existing governance structures, what's worked, what hasn't worked. And again, you know, really being reflective 
and using this forced pause to be able to do that has actually proven to be really helpful and has sort of probably kickstarted a lot of discussions that, you know, even for us, we've not necessarily had to have, but because we've had to react fairly quickly, it's it's become, you know, fairly, fairly uh, prevalent to now think about governance much more strategically. And lastly, I think remaining vigilant. So although the region for us, I think yesterday the curfew has been officially lifted and we're somewhat thinking that the pandemic is over. Um, unfortunately, it, it's not. But at the same point, we need to think about how can we stay ahead of the curve as much as we possibly can? You know, crisis response, how are we quickly to adapt? How are we able to respond? And making sure that we try and sort of remain vigilant because news still changes globally, you know, whether it's here in the GCC, you know, whether it's in Asia, Europe, or the US, there's been reactions that are, you know, it's fairly overlapping, but also we're sort of still in somewhat of an unknown. And then if I may as well, sort of just touch on this. So as I'm sure a lot of you are sort of quite aware of, on the side here, you can see that these are kind of the key characteristics in terms of the formation of a family office, which I know that we're all quite, we're all aware of. But Actually, if you will look at that, I'm going to highlight on, on two key points. I'd love to highlight on point number five, but maybe for you, Yasmin, I'll do that another time, is about sort of the impact and the philanthropy arm. But actually, I know I've, I've sort of said a couple of times now about the importance of governance, but also about re-looking really at our investment approach. And, you know, some of the questions that we've been, we've been thinking about is, when it comes to governance, are we, are we addressing the four rooms? Are we looking at the family, the owners, the board, management? Are we thinking about what perhaps we've missed during the pandemic and what are we actually focusing on now so we need to perhaps even think about revisit existing policies reintroducing i'll touch a little bit about the importance of the rise of digitization and also how this is also going to make quite an impact in family offices um, but i'll touch on that maybe later on and then also next generation and i say that as a direct uh, experience because having now worked much closer to our family business as well really having to understand whether it be the current family leaders, the current structure, and making sure that we're almost, you know, I sort of give the analogy of, of passing the baton uh, to my father, which is a painful discussion at times, um, but it's something that we know, it's something that we need to address. Um, so I think overall, there's a lot that we know and that we we don't know about sort of COVID and, and the impact that the pandemic is going to make. I think there's going to be somewhat of a paradigm shift in terms of whether it's the physical office space. I know that that's actually something that has affected across sectors, across industries. You know, what is the future of work? What does that look like? And at the same point, I think that we're all still craving and our face-to-face -face meetings and our, our interactions, but how has this shifted? How has this changed? And much more if we look into whether family, single family offices are looking at much more of a hybrid approach, what are our investment mandates? And, you know, I think I, I personally feel that it's still fairly premature to say that this is what the exact impact is. I think that we still have a lot of learning to do. I think there are certain things that we do know, obviously, as I mentioned, that redundancies have been there. How can we avoid that? How can we think about, you know, what are, what are we doing to be more adoptive of new technologies? And how are we shaping sort of the future discussions, making sure that, you know, if we are ever faced with a global pandemic, in which but I hope we're not, how are we able to react to that? So I'm going to keep it there because I feel that I've already gone slightly over time. Um, so really conscious of that. And I'm really delighted to, to hand over to Kareem after this. But I just wanted to touch on a few points here and really looking forward to, to us knowledge sharing and to learn from you as well. So um, thank you very much and, and looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you so much, Zahara. This was fantastic. Um, we already are getting questions and comments, which is fantastic. Uh, I'll promise I'll, we'll try to get to as many questions and comments as we can. Uh, I cannot promise that we can cover everything, but I hope you'll stick with us and uh, we'll try to get as many to as many as we can. Uh, so, Karim, thank you so much for uh, like I'll hand over to you and thank you for your introductory remark. Thank you very much, Farida. Thank you, Zahra. Thank you to the Pearl Initiative. Uh, and to Tharawat as well for giving me this uh, opportunity to speak today. Uh, definitely very interesting times, unprecedented. Nobody uh, saw this coming. If you asked anybody six months ago, where would you be? They would definitely tell you they would be uh, on a nice, on a, sitting on a nice beach in Greece or uh, somewhere in the Mediterranean. Definitely not uh, at home 
or in an office or uh, nobody knew what the word Zoom meant uh, probably six months ago. So definitely the world has changed. The world is definitely a different place and we've all had to learn in different ways. Uh, just a little bit about me. Um, my name is Kirim. I work at Electron. Electron is a second generation family business uh, based in the UAE. Been around for over 45 years. Uh, our line of business is in engineering services and in distribution for the oil and gas, telecommunication, uh, construction sector. Uh, so these are all areas which we're all very familiar with in the Middle East. But unfortunately, these are all areas that have been heavily affected uh, during these times. The pandemic was a global pandemic, but we had another uh, regional uh, challenge that we had to go through during this time. Oil prices. I mean, these are two challenges that nobody thought would come hand in hand. Um, we've had to, we've learned from the previous uh, drop in oil prices in the past uh, 10 years. We've seen waves uh, of ups and downs of investments. Uh, however, this is definitely not something we could uh, plan. Uh, our response to the pandemic as an organization was different. It, it's, uh, we, had to, we had to look and go in day by day uh, because regulations were changing throughout, uh, throughout the time. Uh, you would uh, get up in the morning, hear something, and the evening rules would change. So it was very, very difficult to, to plan this. And if you asked anybody um, what, uh, what textbooks uh, would tell you, I don't believe there's any textbook that would tell you the whole world would shut down. Uh, I do also believe that planning is important, but there was one thing that was paramount throughout this whole pandemic. It was the health and safety of our staff and their families. Uh, that was essentially what we wanted to focus on. And that was where we started. And we, then we started evolving towards looking at our business continu continuity plan. We have one. It was gathering dust throughout the years. We, were never, uh, we never thought of using it, but we looked at it and we said, okay, how do we react? How do, what can we do to make sure this is as smooth as possible? We know it's gonna be a challenge. We know there's gonna be a lot of uh, work involved in adapting to this new reality. We had to engage with numerous groups, locally, regionally, globally as well. I'm a member of uh, other groups uh, at, uh, in the region and throughout the world where I do engage with them and started asking, what are you guys going through? How are you tackling this? It was also important to engage all the stakeholders that we had as an organization, whether it's our customers, whether it's our, uh, uh, our staff, our employees, uh, our suppliers. And this, was, uh, uh, this required a lot of effort and several Zoom calls, several uh, meetings to understand how they're reacting. Uh, we talked to our um, uh, colleagues and associates in, in China because they were the first to see this and first to witness this. Uh, how are they reacting? How are they adapting? It was a very, very interesting uh, learning lesson from their side. However, no two regions witnessed things exactly the same. Every local authority reacted in a different way. And we had to we had to be at the forefront of this. Uh, we had uh, we had an incident where regulations changed at 9 p.m. There was a curfew, and people were not allowed to move, with, with the exception of essential workers. The, the rules were announced at 9 p.m., and people could not move unless they had a permit, and they were considered essential workers. Uh, our permits were issued 12 hours later, 9 a.m. the next morning. People have to get to work. Well, how do you react to this? What kind of planning do you do? So obviously, challenges. Very difficult, Numer numerous, uh, numerous uh, shots being fired every, every morning, every evening, and we'd have to tackle them. We also had to look at our digital infrastructure. Obviously, customers, our customers, uh, we operate in a very critical sector, the oil and gas sector, the utility sector. These are sectors that don't stop. 
regardless of what happens. These are sectors that don't stop and they have to move on. And we were asked numerous times by our customers, please ensure that we have supplies. Please ensure that you're, uh, you can deliver on time because they have their KPIs like we have our KPIs. So we had to, we had to go through a very testy period. Uh, digital infrastructure, we had to look at it. Do we have it? Yes, we do. We've invested, uh, we've invested in digital infrastructure for over 10 years, but we've never had to test it the way we tested it uh, over the past few months. Thankfully, we were able to, to cross the path. It, uh, it wasn't easy, but we learned a lot. And throughout this whole process, uh, I can't stress the, the, the level of communication. It was so important to communicate on a regular basis. Uh, and by regular, uh, I mean daily with, with, our, with our staff to see how they're coping, what kind of challenges they're, they're seeing, what can they do, what can they not do, how is this affecting them. Uh, we live in a very, very interesting place. Uh, the UAE did an extraordinary job reacting to, uh, to the pandemic. Um, we had security of supply 24 hours a day. There was very little impact. Uh, one thing that uh, comes to mind is food. Food security was there. Um, we never really had to face an issue. Uh, it brought me back to uh, to my days in the UK 10 years ago, or almost maybe 15 years ago, or when, when the volcanic ash cloud happened in the UK and everything was closed. Everything had shut down. The only thing on the shelves in the supermarkets when the volcanic ash cloud was there were strawberries and potatoes. I can assure you, we had everything here on the shelves. And it was a very, very uh, successful challenge. And it really showed the level of leadership, showed the level of um, agility, uh, and investments have paid off, uh, whether it was digital, whether it was communication, uh, the, the investments that were done and throughout these sectors, and this, particularly telecom and uh, the internet. Nobody thought the internet would be as important as it is today. Uh, we've all been able to communicate with one another. We are not disconnected, we are more connected than we have ever been. And this is, this is because of the investments that have been done over time. Um, we are still not, it's not over yet, but we've learned a lot throughout the, throughout the past three months. Uh, we as an organization are, uh, are very lucky because we have a great team uh, that was feeding us a lot of information to make better decisions. Um, but at the same time, people were determined as ever to, uh, to make sure that we cross through this um, a better and stronger organization. And I can assure you that we are still very strong and uh, we are very capable. And we are uh, we are still uh, we're continually uh, continuously learning about what's to come. People are talking about um, the resurgence of the coronavirus later this year. I I can assure you that we're a lot better prepared than we are, and we will be able to face this. Um, the, the leadership had in our organization was able to make decisions remotely and very quickly. We were very agile, very dynamic, and we were listening, continuously listening to what people wanted. I myself was uh, was trying to uh, adapt as much as possible. It was very challenging. Uh, I was staying home as much as possible, but I was also going out as, as well. And uh, I do. I went out several times, and uh, I got coronavirus. I, uh, I had to stay home in quarantine for 14 days. Um, but I, I, I learned, I mean, I, I learned that you can stay connected. It's not the worst thing in the world. And there are worse things going on in this world. But more importantly, we are, we're very, very lucky and very grateful that we can think about the long term and think about the medium term. Um, because the short term is really pretty much clear. We understand where we're going. We understand the path. Uh, we've seen what China has gone through. Uh, but I mean, there are other parts of, in the region uh, where family businesses are really, really struggling. I mean, in the Levant, for example, and particularly Lebanon. Lebanon's going through uh, through a very tough time. The short-term needs are 
are paramount, uh, medium and uh, long-term uh, objectives are uh, are are important, but they're they're uh, they're, they're being uh, pr the short term is being prioritized just to ensure food, to ensure sustainability, to ensure continuity, business continuity. So definitely a lot to touch on, a lot to talk about. Uh, I don't believe this is over, but we've learned a lot, and I think all the organizations on this call um, and uh, stakeholders and contributors uh, have a lot to share, which I'd love to hear. Fantastic. Thank you, Thank you so much, Karim. Thank you very much. That was a great kind of a very personal insight. Uh, thank you for being so, um, you know, open to sharing. I think it is a it is a time where, um, at least in Sarawak, we see this, there is a need also, uh, people feel the need to kind of interact with their peers and learn from other people's experiences. Because as you say, it is such a, such a possibly once in a lifetime, hopefully once in a lifetime experience that we're going through. So uh, thank you so much for that. So I'd like to I'd like to focus our conversation a little bit on on the on the on the main topic of today, which is governance. And um, you know what? How has governance been impacted? How have family businesses responded to this crisis? What can we learn from that? And I can also see that most of the questions or comments that we have uh, kind of are going in that direction. So before we dive into um, this conversation a bit more in depth, I'd like to involve our participants by asking a first. Uh, question and I'm calling up a poll which I hope you should see on your screens now so um, please tell us do you believe governance structures of family businesses are well prepared for a moment of crisis I'll give you a couple of seconds to respond and we hope that everybody can give their opinion okay so it's I can, I can see the progress and I'm telling you, uh, it's going to be very, very interesting. Um, so I'll give you another few seconds to respond. Thanks to everybody who's giving us opinions. And I'll just close the poll now. All right. Yep. Um, so let me share the response. Can you see? Okay, so here we go, uh, which is not uh, very surprising, to be honest. Do you believe the governance structures um, in Gulf family businesses are well prepared for moments of crisis? 11% amongst our participants said yes, and 89% said no. So, uh, initial reaction, uh, maybe Zahara, any any kind of just off the cuff um, responses to this? Well, I think I think we, I mean we, we were talking about this earlier as well. I think it's not surprising. I think we were kind of all expecting that. I think even pre-pandemic governance and the importance of governance in the family business sector has has very much been a topic. Um, you know, we need to think about you know it. There's a, there are benefits to some extent because when you are in a pandemic and you need to be reactive, being less bureaucratic has actually probably proven to be uh, an ability to be agile and to be able to respond. Um, but at the same point, I mean, being a fierce sort of positive opportunist in this in this sense is that if, if we believe that 89% of, of those that are on this call feel that, that governance is still, the infrastructure isn't there, then how can we continue to build an ecosystem that allows us to be able to fuel that? What are we lacking? Is there something that we could all do together? If, if more, more so than ever, I feel a sense of camaraderie. I feel this is a time for us to, you know, exchange what has worked, what hasn't worked, what policies Absolutely. are in place. I mean, you know, again, I, I, I've touched on it slightly, but the role of digitization, have we got digital policies in place to be able to make sure that it's very clear for those? I mean, you know what is what is the future of the workforce and then actually are we are we utilizing our governance for those the 11 percent that say yes you know are we addressing our board are we addressing those key stakeholders and how are we doing that so i think for me it's it's more i can absolutely understand why um why there is where why no is so high because i think governance has always been something that you know there's 
there's still a bridge that needs to be built there. And I don't necessarily think, and I think the reason why personally, it's because not one size fits all. And I think that's what the biggest issue is. So I think in the family business and office space, there's this constant sort of discussion of governance and it goes back to even, you know, topics like, you know, how do you measure the impact of the governance in each family business? And what, why do we do it? Do we do it for the sake of doing it because we, we have to do it because there are systems in place that, you know, we, we need to be sure to have that or is there actual, does it make us more efficient? Does it actually be able to pass on that baton to next generations because we've got that governance in place? So um, I agree. Unfortunately, but then at the same point, more so than ever, how can we continue to build that ecosystem that governance is, is defined and determined? But then again, as I said, not one size fits all. So we need to be mindful for that as well. So that's just my, my, my few thoughts. Well, thank you for that. I, I, I do believe um, in handing over to Karim, uh, perhaps we can also talk a little bit about you know, what does governance mean? Because obviously it is a bit of a misleading question as well. And it is a bit of a provocative question, right? Because, you know, there is never, uh, first of all, not one size fits all, but also which parts of governance did not work, right? So maybe there were aspects, as you said, and I am, I am a firm believer that informal governance is governance, uh, and that perhaps that is a very effective and efficient way of dealing with crisis. Um, and just because you don't have all the policies written down, you know, if you've survived, for example, in Karim's case, if the family business has survived 40 years, um, that also means that there, there are a lot of things that are done well. So I would say maybe you can comment on that aspect as well, Karim. Absolutely. I, I think, I think uh, that's exactly what I wanted to touch on, um, what I wanted to touch on, Farida. Uh, when, if, if you, governance is a very, very difficult uh, point to measure. Uh, for, for many reasons. I mean, particularly people, if, if you want to judge things on a day-to-day -day basis, it's very, very difficult to measure. But if you if you look at governance uh, on, a, on a UAE level where I'm based, and you look at what, uh, what they've achieved over 50 years, that, that requires a lot of governance, it requires leadership, it requires ownership um, by numerous stakeholders and not one individual uh, particularly. Um, so, this is this is the kind of governance. If you look at a place like Dubai, Dubai's uh, been been on the map for many many decades. It's not it hasn't been on the map only uh, since Dubai Marina or Burj Khalifa. Dubai's been uh, the capital, and they've uh, they've adapted, and and there's been governance, there's been leadership, and but the governance has changed. The type of governance and the definition of governance has changed over the years. Uh, you have people that. Uh, that used to govern uh, govern in different ways. I mean, you had you had the culture of in the Middle East of the majlis governance, where people would sit down in the majlis, and this was a form of govern governance. This does not mean that it's perfect. It uh, doesn't uh, also doesn't mean that it's it's a complete failure. I believe that there are uh, there are success stories uh, mm -hmm. with this level of governance. Uh, in, in every single culture, there's a different type of governance, but this level of governance here. In this throughout this pandemic was very interesting because you had a lot of family firms come forth and say how can they contribute and ask the, the local authorities how they could contribute everybody contributed in a different way whether it was financial whether it was philanthropy whether people were opening um, opening doors or whether they're contributing uh, uh, food medicine whatever it is but People were taking leadership and taking matters into their own hands, and uh, and this was a form of governance. And mind you, this is a culture where people are used to interacting; they're used to face-to-face -face interaction. This was a very very different time because this was no longer an option. Uh, if if you look at the leadership here, the leadership is used to this measureless type of governance. Uh, that was not really an option. Uh, there was a form of governance now. It was uh, done uh, via people's laptops and iPads and, and iPhones. So it was a very, very different type of governance. We've had to adapt. We're, we've had to embrace the change rather than try to fight it. And this is these are the these are the things that we're going through. But over 50 years, that's a proper that's a proper way of looking at it. And and just to add on what Zahra is saying, we need more platforms to to discuss governance. Discuss how governance is in the Gulf. 
I can assure you the governance in the Gulf is very different than the governance in China or in India or in Russia or anywhere in, uh, in, in Europe. Every culture has its own form of governance. We do have our own uh, form of governance. Unfortunately, it's not very well documented uh, as, uh, as it is in other cultures, but we do have that. And we as a family business, we do not have the textbook governance. We are a relatively small organization. We're an SME. Uh, very dynamic. We've had to adapt. We've had to embrace change. We've changed uh, throughout time. Uh, however, at the same time, we were always listening to what people uh, what people uh, were saying, what the market is saying, and th these were all signals. And we had to, throughout time, we had to practice governance in our own mm -hmm. uh, own way, shape, and form. Mm -hmm. And and as a smaller organization, throughout throughout time, uh, throughout uh, the past few months, we've had to engage uh, with one another. In the family and in the organization, with our senior uh, senior staff, uh, with in different ways, whether it was with regular phone calls, whether it was face to face discussions, there was there were numerous times and numerous challenges that we had. Uh, that we were really struggling. We were saying, "What are we going to do? How are we going to do this? How are we going to do that?" But eventually, mm -hmm. we we found our bearings and we moved forward. And this is the level of governance. And I can assure you, the majority of uh, SMEs go through this day in day out, and as a family business, you have to wear many hats. You can't you can't just be you can't just be finance. You have to be finance and HR and and uh, sales man and coffee boy sometimes. Time. And this is this is the this is the reality. You have to wear many hats. Absolutely. And because you have to wear many hats, that's also kind of governance. Right? Very true. So, so this is a very interesting, and I'm, I'm trying to kind of summarize some of the comments that we're getting as well, and some of the questions. Um, so. In, in Sarawat, for us, obviously, it's also been a very interesting time. And the advantage of being a MENA organization is that literally, basically, on a day-to-day -day basis, I've had conversations over the past two and a half months with business leaders from literally all the way from Mauritania all the way to Yemen and kind of try to understand what everybody is going through. It was a fascinating snapshot of, of kind of the importance of, of uh, family firms in their local environment, but also what they're going through. Now, we've, we've noticed that from a governance perspective, there's been a bit of a difference from a, the timeline perspective. So I'll, I'll explain a little bit what I mean by that. Um, so we've had the initial emergency situation, which was literally, it hit us, we had to react um, spontaneous decision making, very swift decision making, where um, you know governance played a certain role, and I'd like you to comment a little bit on the different types of governance. Um, then I think we moved on to a phase of kind of the business continuity planning. So how do we how do we bridge the next let's say three months, uh, kind of very short term stabilization of the business? And I feel that most of the companies that I'm talking to now are starting the recovery phase. So obviously take into, into consideration the perfect storm economically that we're in right now with kind of the, the, the economic challenges, microeconomic challenges. But I think most families are now entering into a phase of recovery. So that kind of is like the onion of complexities. We have a timeline that moves very quickly. And then at the same time, we have these different governance systems that have to play into each other. So I'd like you to perhaps comment a little bit on which governance entities you feel have played major roles in, in these three phases and, you know, perhaps in your own firms, but also from what you've observed from other family firms. Nagi Zahara. I was going to hand over to Karim there because I thought it sort of tied in nicely what we were saying earlier, but I think so, so you rightly put, Frida, a great question about um, there's so many different components um, and different stakeholders within sort of the governance structure, but then at the same point, you know, there are kind of, th I, I've always seen that sort of three key components. So you've got sort of the, the periodic, which is sort of that annual, you know, meeting that we get everyone together. Mm -hmm. And it's, and obviously, for, you know, a lot of that has happened virtually, um, whether it's ourselves or other family offices and groups that we know of. Um, and then actually, it's been interesting. I mean, even sort of family council meetings, which perhaps were, you know, quarterly for some, and weren't necessarily seen as something daily. And as Kareem alluded to earlier, actually the importance of communication more so than ever to be able to address the currents, even just within governance, as well as you know the business itself. So I think that's there's definitely been a rise of that. I mean, I've seen that past me as well as across my peers. Um, and actually also, again, it comes down to the constitution per se, right? So the family constitution, and this is where obviously the layers of governance, whether it's, you know, you do have a, a board of directors in place who 
you know, I think there's been some interesting analysis done here about whether in the GCC or the UAE, we use our board of directors properly, whether we actually see their expertise as something that we can tie into our governance. And I think sometimes we actually neglect that. I mean, even for me, when I set up Grosvenor Capital, I was very much sort of, I've used, I've actually probably used professional advisors and not realized actually even now understanding the journey between having you know an advisory group versus actually a board of directors and sometimes just differentiating the two which is something that we don't do enough so we don't understand that actually there is definitely importance of having a you know an advisory group and I, I personally consider them as, as mentors for me within impact investing but then if you look at the family office space and you're saying well you have access to a board of directors are we being flexible enough for them? Are we, I mean, even for my father, I mean, now he's very Zoom savvy and absolutely is completely fine with it, but actually being flexible with the fact that you might have a director sitting in the US, be mindful of their time, be able to incorporate the board of directors into the discussion. And that's to benefit because again, I think especially more so than ever, because we've had to crisis manage, we've been very reactive that actually we've perhaps not utilized the fact that we do have right. these resources. And right. whether it is, it is an advisory um, opportunity, I think that there is a lot more sophistication that's needed. And I know that Tarawat does amazing um, you know, publications on this and the importance of board of directors, as well as the initiatives that, that Pearl puts together. I think that these are, di these are just questions that we need to have. And I, I don't think it's pride. I don't want to say it is pride, but I do sometimes feel that we don't lean on what an actual director can do to be able to facilitate the government. And what goes bottom up is very important. Your employees, those that are actually channeling your vision, making sure the business is in place, but actually the top-down approach sometimes within the family office space, I feel that that's been neglected. And I think that more so than ever, um, short-term has been, as you said, we've been reactive, we're going into some form of normalcy now, but actually if we're looking at our long-term, what are the tools that we actually have to hand? And if we don't have them, then how can we build those? And if we don't have access to build those because it doesn't make sense for us, how? where yes. do we leave ones to make sure that we can get that guidance and support? So Absolutely. yeah, I mean, that's, that's my thoughts. I think that's a very interesting observation. And I'd like to um, ask Karim if, you know, obviously I'd love to have your comments in general on the question, but also do you feel that having gone through this kind of emergency phase, business continuity phase, and now kind of going into recovery, um, do you feel there are any measures in your own governance system that you feel you'd like to take to make sure that you can perhaps be more ready next time? Or if, you know, any, maybe not for a next pandemic, hopefully, but, you know, for, for any other type of difficult situations that you that you think your business could go through in the, in the future? Absolutely, uh, Farida, absolutely. I mean, we've learned so much throughout uh, uh, over the past few months, um, uh, ju just just to uh, just to give you a, a very very good example, um, throughout the throughout the pandemic, what we saw here in the UAE, and I'm sure you guys saw something very similar in other parts of the world, is th the world has changed. People have changed. The uses of uh, the, the 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 priorities have changed. Um, like we said, digital infrastructure. The priorities have changed. The IT department overnight became the most important department in the company. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. You know, that was at the beginning. And, and then throughout the streamlined. Food security. Uh, the, the, the number of food security startups that, have, that we've been hearing about yeah. has increased. Uh, it, it, was not, it was not a priority. Uh, it was not a priority as much as it is now. Um, mm -hmm. This is. Uh, I, I remember when when 9/11 happened. You had the TSA. It was it was the trigger word. Everybody started talking about the TSA for yeah. the for five years after. Now, if you ask people, what are they talking about? They're talking about the coronavirus. They're talking about the pandemic. They're talking about digital infrastructure. They're talking about how to adapt. They're talking about food security. Priorities have changed, and and this was very very important. And this was. It, it took a pandemic for all these things to, to start to start to become the most important thing. Uh, there's people look at things very differently now. There's no reason to buy your strawberries from uh, from Peru, produce them locally. There's no reason to get your salmon from Norway or from Canada, produce it locally. Everything became local, and the emphasis on local and local content has become greater than ever. 
in the in the UAE. They've uh, they've introduced an initiative uh, to uh, to push for local content, uh, and it's it's given a lot more priority. And uh, uh, this has been done in Saudi Arabia. This has been done in the UAE. This has been done in uh, in other uh, oil producing nations. But the the priorities of uh, the priorities of of uh, of, of these initiatives has changed throughout. Family businesses are at the forefront of this, and they are the people that are driving these things. Um, right. That is very, very important. Uh, and then going back to going to back to what Zara saying and uh, and uh, board of directors, I think I think what people are talking about is uh, experience. The the purpose of getting the board of directors is to give you guidance, to give you experience. I, I don't believe there's a board of directors that can give you this level of uh, experience and know-how about um, about what is uh, about the pandemic, uh, unless they're from the Spanish flu era, which we don't really have anymore. So this is the kind of expertise that you need in a board of directors: guidance and to main uh, to maintain uh, the vision and to maintain where you want to go and how you want to get out of this in, in a smooth fashion. So this is very very important. But the board of directors is essential, but the board of directors needs to give you insight and guidance. And and uh, and board of directors for a pandemic. I mean, I I can assure you, there's a lot of board of directors that can give you guidance on on uh, the, the economic situation. But on a pandemic, is it's it's, uh, of course it's, a it's, it's one of those one of those uh, challenges that we will only learn from one another and from the people on the ground that are going through the challenges. Very interesting. I'd like to link into this conversation on the board of directors, and I'd like to just uh, involve once again our our actually experts that are listening to us, because I, I I have to say I'm very impressed with the level of attendees that we have. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, the following question um, regarding the board of directors: Which of the following should be the first priority for family business board of directors in times of crisis? So. Do you think they should focus on health and safety first of employees, ensuring business continuity, reputation management and interaction with stakeholders, communication with shareholders, or do you think we've missed an important point that uh, they should be focusing on? Uh, I'll give you a couple of seconds again to, to answer. Um, I'm very impressed with the speed of voting here. So it's uh, going very, very fast. Um, and I think it's going to be interesting to perhaps then close off our conversation um, in, in talking a little bit about some concrete takeaways that uh, perhaps we can we can suggest uh, family businesses to, to look at in the next in the next phase. So let me close this and share the results with you. So very interesting, quite a little bit more distributed than I thought it would be. So 22% said uh, health and safety of employees. 61% said ensuring business continuity, 9% said uh, reputation management interaction with stakeholders, and 9% uh, said other. So quite a, quite a nicely distributed um, uh, kind of uh, response here. Um, I'd like to perhaps start off with a double question. The first question relates to the board of directors. So the board of directors, and we've noticed this also in, in kind of amongst our Sarawak members, is of course a core engine in these moments because they connect shareholders with the executive management. So they're they're kind of ideally placed to kind of make sure that there is a coordinated response to the situation. Um, do you feel like going forward, you will look at your board of directors differently? I mean, you alluded both of you a little bit to that. So maybe concretely, how would you how would you address that? And kind of the second part of the question, what are some of the takeaway learning points that you would share with other family businesses from your own personal experience, but also you can share from things that you've seen around you with you know, your friends from family businesses? Uh, maybe right. Karim, let's, let's start. No, let's start with Karim for once, because yeah, obviously, was, you know, yeah, we've been starting with that and we're, you know, <laughs> we're fair here. Fair enough. So All right, go ahead, Karim. that's a very good question, uh, Farida. I, I think um, I think the board of directors has a very key role, um, uh, a very key role in in any organization, and it gives guidance, uh, particularly uh, during times of uh, times of need, and it maintains allows you to stay focused. Um, 
And, uh, you know, tomorrow is a new day, new challenges, but throughout, by the end of the year, we want to have, we want to be able to still achieve the goal. And I think the board of directors is essential. I think, uh, I think the board of directors also has a role to make sure and allow the management to be agile, be dynamic, be, uh, allow them to be reactive in different ways, give them that level of flexibility. The world moves a lot quicker now than it did a year ago. Uh, the challenges that we're facing are much uh, uh, much quicker. You have to be reactive. You have to have a crisis management uh, uh, system in place where you can react and take decisions and take leadership. And if if we are going to sit and wait for a board of directors, that's uh, that, that unfortunately then it becomes counterintuitive. I think we should embrace the challenges. I think it's it's nice to see that they're. Uh, People have, have realized what's important, family businesses particularly. They're looking at uh, things in a, a very different perspective. And I think the family firms are going to take the lead on this because uh, they are the majority in the, in, in the sports world. Absolutely. And uh, particularly in, in the Gulf, I, I know that's for sure. Uh, they also have to look at uh, continuity, like, like your poll suggests. Uh, many of the family businesses in the Middle East are are now going through this transition, second generation. Yes. Uh, so definitely, that that level of communication is important. That level of um, uh, succession, where people understand what kind of challenges they have witnessed, what they uh, what's to come, and how to be reactive and how to learn. I think it's important that we keep this level of communication going. Uh, and this discussion can't stop at any point. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Gahara, over to you. Thank you so much. I mean, to really iterate some of Kareem's really great points, um, I think, as I alluded to earlier, um, the board of directors, perhaps we don't utilize them enough. And I mean, at the moment, we, we're build, we're as a self, we're building this, this infrastructure at the moment because we now see more so than ever that we need to do so. Um, but if I look at, again, some of my peers where, you know, as, as Kareem said, if we, we've got to make sure that we utilize it properly as well. We don't want to be become too archaic because I think there is a sort of notion of governance equals to bureaucracy, which I know I've said, and also archaic models. But actually, if we're able to create springboards and sort of say, well, if we can build efficiencies, I think we've all had to become efficient during this time then we need to be able to, to inform that we utilize board of directors accordingly. Um, and again, as I said, whether it's, whether it's, I mean, typically it's, it's very much seen as human capital and social capital. So, you know, trying to build efficiencies around business models for families, which is why we have them. But are, are we really maximizing that opportunity? Perhaps not. And I think more so than ever, we need to do so. Um, and in terms of, in terms of some sort of, Future takeaways. I mean, I don't. I probably. I think. I think Kareem hit the nail on a lot of the, the points he made about the directors. So I won't harp on about that too much. Um, but in terms of some of the learnings um, from peers and whatnot. So interestingly enough, um, in the sort of impact investing space or just the general investment space, I mean, there's been a state of consolidation for the last 18 to 24 months generally. Um, I've noticed that with family offices, whether it's you know. Um, just understanding investment mandates, where where positions are at the moment. So I think generally, and I think there was a really interesting report that UBS had done. Again, I'm happy to share a lot of this stuff with you, Farida, to, to share around. Thank but you. It, I think there was an interesting survey that UBS had done that said that 55% of family offices, even pre-COVID, had already started being in a state of consolidation and actually understanding that they might need to reduce investment, um, look at models, because as I said, uh, I'll, you know, I'll mention buzzwords like Brexit again, but there has been so many global um, events in the last couple of years that have forced a lot of us to, to be in that state of consolidation. So I think, if anything, the pandemic has created a springboard um, to be able to look at that. I think some of the other things are, how are we managing our risk? I think we didn't touch on that. I know that's probably an entire topic separately, risk management. And Kareem, you touched on that really well at the start of the introduction, where essentially we, we all had to think about risk, crisis, management, and perhaps that's probably a discussion for another time. Um, mm -hmm. What are the contingency plans that have been put in place? Some of the other things are, and alluding to your survey, where we're saying 61% are saying that there's that continuation of business. So how are we maintaining our daily operations? 
And essentially, again, I know that that's been kind of some of the key operational risks that some of the family offices have been looking at. They've been looking at IT infrastructure, digitization, uh, you know, again, are we looking at Zoom and then there were issues with Zoom and, and what, what are we doing for our security and the risks around that? And then I, I, I also reassured to know that 24, 22% of our um, guests today believe that health and safety of our employees are, you know, is imperative and absolutely, if not so more than ever, because I think it's now is the time that we we all join forces and we think about that because we're in this together. I think we've all been affected. And they go hand in hand, right, as well. They kind of absolutely. are connected. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think, and you know, I think it's about creating that atypical environment, which is kind of naturally, organically had to happen. Um, so, I mean, I think my overall notion is that we know there are some things that we know, and I know I, I again alluded to that in my presentation that. There are some things that we absolutely know. We know that we know how to be more reactive, but equally, there's a lot we don't know. Um, we don't know the impact that this pandemic is going to actually make, and whether it's just, you know, I, I, I don't see it necessarily as the catalyst because I think that there were previous existing preconditions of the economy and markets that have actually pushed us in this direction. But of course, it's unfortunately perhaps spearheaded and, and, and pushed us into that more so. So I think we need to be mindful of the fact that there's still a lot to learn. Um, mm -hmm. And it's it's reassuring to know that we're there's a growing community in the UAE through and 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 the GCC and through Parawat and Pearl Initiative. It's great to know that there's so many of us that are trying to build this and and, and build this infrastructure. So you know that's been very reassuring. But I think more so than ever, the time is now to be able to do that. So that's my final tuppence. Um, Thank you so much. <laughs> I think I think both of you and 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 first of all thank you very much uh, to both of you for first of all taking the time at a very busy moment uh, in 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 our lives um and and for the honesty and the and the frankness with which you've shared your personal experiences but also how you've analyzed kind of our overall situation and um I kind of I'm aware of time, so I have to slowly start closing the session, unfortunately. Um, I'm very sorry to those people that we haven't been able to answer the specific questions, but you can always contact Sarawat or, or Pearl Initiative. So just to close off our conversation, perhaps a bit of a, a reflective um, uh, couple of comments. And on behalf of Sarawat and Pearl Initiative, I think we both organizations why we are passionate about family businesses is because um we've been passionate about family businesses for a long time but i think particularly with the phase that we are about to enter uh, which is going to be a very challenging economic reality uh, family firms are going to be more important than ever right um they are going to be the key part of of recovery uh, they are the the entities that think long term that will um invest in 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 you know their communities more than perhaps other commercial entities so we need to make sure that the conversation around best practice and and peer learning and peer sharing stays alive because i think that is where and and i believe karim and both you and and zahara have echoed that is that the easiest way for a family business to learn is to learn from each other and i believe that's really at the heart of of what we what we all are doing we are really in a moment of of and I'm coming back to my onion principle or concentric circles. We have the pandemic, we have the economic, um, macroeconomic situation that's going to be difficult, but then all of this is embedded in the fourth industrial revolution, which obviously um, is the big arch that is going to lead, you know, through the next 20, 30 years and is going to transform the reality um, in which we operate as businesses. So I think as family businesses, we have to be very mindful that we are dealing with huge forces that shape our environments and uh, that go beyond the normal geopolitical forces that we that as arab family businesses or as middle eastern family businesses we kind of know how to deal with them but there are overarching forces that we have to be very mindful of that we have to realize and coming back to our topic of governance those topics those those macro trends have to be reflected in how we organize our governance Structures. So um, this just kind of perhaps to summarize a little bit why we think that the conversation about governance is so important. And again, coming back to my two um, speaker friends here, uh, I'd like to thank you both for the amazing conversation. Uh, I'd like to thank our audience for sticking with us. 
and for the great conversations and, and great comments that I've seen here and I've received on WhatsApp, so it's been quite interesting. Uh, and I hope that we all keep this conversation alive, keep going and keep sharing. So thank you very much to everybody and I hope you'll have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Farida. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you very much.